Welcome to Watch on Booksellers, and uh, welcome to our evening with the author. We're thrilled tonight to have Deborah Dussel here. Yeah, I have to say one of the best things about being a community bookstore is that we get to welcome our community authors. And Deborah's been a friend of the bookstore since the beginning, I think. Yeah, when yeah. you were in the other location yeah, upstairs. upstairs. Wow. <laughs> that was a long time ago. <laughs> so thank you. This is very exciting for us. Uh, so Deborah is uh, a certified professional organizer and president of In Order Inc. And since 1994, she's helped thousands of clients organize their space, time, and lives. She believes in paring down the excess, stuff, time commitments, weight, so you can spend your time doing the things you love. In her book, Organizing for Weight Loss, A Slim Little Guide to Getting Thinner, Deborah applies her well-established and proven organizing concepts to losing weight. And we're all here. Good evening, and thank you all for coming out tonight. It is my absolute pleasure to be here. When I sold my house in Montclair a number of years ago, one of the things I <clears throat> discovered that I missed most was living in a town with an independent bookstore and particularly one as special as Watch on Booksellers. So I want to thank Margo and Catherine and the whole bookstore team for putting tonight together. It is so great to see so many people I know from so many different walks of my life over many years here, and I really appreciate that you came out to support me tonight with the launch of my first book. For those of you I don't know, my name is Deborah Gussoff, and I am a certified professional organizer. I started my business in order back in 1994 to help my clients streamline, simplify, and declutter their homes and offices. And when people hear that I've been in business for over 25 years, invariably the first thing they ask is, how did you get started? I like to say that this career path is my socially acceptable way of rebelling. <laughs> I was raised by a terminal pack rat with a hoarding disorder, and the house I grew up in was chaotic. I have really vivid memories of being nine or ten years old and spending part of the weekend organizing the uh, supplies in my desk and the closets in my childhood bedroom. <laughs> I can credit my mother not only for my career, but also for some of my food issues. As I write in my book, um, while I was growing up, particularly during my elementary school and middle school years, my mother fashioned herself as a gourmet cook. <laughs> and she experimented with all kinds of unusual recipes and interesting ingredients. And while I might have enjoyed those as an adult, today, as a child, I deemed them an unmitigated disaster. <laughs> One of her favorite things was a recipe called pea mousse. <laughs> so pea mousse was a frothy, jiggly concoction made with peas, gelatin, heavy cream, and God knows what else. And she would take it and mix it all together, and then she would put it in this stainless steel ice cream bottle <laughs> and refrigerate it until it became solidified. It was absolutely vile, and my brothers and I hated it. <laughs> so when I was in second grade, my teacher, Mrs. Watkins, gave us a writing assignment. She told us that we had to write an essay about the thing that we hated most. <laughs> and I chose pea mousse. <laughs> My teacher, having never heard of pea mousse, because of course who had, decided that I must have misspelled the object of my dislike, and she corrected pea mousse to be peat moss. <laughs> <laughs> I took the essay home to show my mother, and I remember very clearly her comment being, I guess your teacher isn't much of a cook, is she? <laughs> <laughs> so my siblings and I complained about the various foods that we disliked so much that my mother must have gotten really fed up, pun intended. <laughs> and she created something called The List. And here's how it worked. On the first day of the month, we were each allowed to pick three items that we did not have to eat that month. 
but the proviso was that we had to use anything else she created oh. without complaint. Oh. And we had to be quite strategic about the things that we put on the list because some of her creations were seasonal. So for example, orange squash souffle was a fall dish and that had to be on the list for all three months during the fall. But once that orange squash became out of season in spr late spring, summer, we could take it off the list and put something else on. <laughs> but pea moose had to stay on the list all the time. She never knew when that was gonna show up on the dinner table. <laughs> so I asked, is it any wonder that I have food issues? <laughs> so pregnancy and the birth of my second child saw me gain about 30 pounds. And when my daughter was approaching her preteen years, I realized I probably couldn't attribute my expanded waistline to baby weight any longer. <laughs> I needed to take action. So as I mentioned, professionally, I'm a certified professional organizer. And at some point, it occurred to me that I could apply my organizing expertise to the goal of weight loss. And it worked. So with any project, you need to have a firmly established why. Whenever you're creating goals, whether for weight loss, saving for a down payment on a house, organizing said house, advancing in your career, whatever it is, it's important to know what's behind that goal, what it is that truly matters. Any what needs a why to bolster it. When you know the why, the what and the how get easier. And when your why is strong enough, that's enough to keep you moving forward especially when the road gets rocky. So in my book, I talk about SMART goals. And this is a concept I learned back in my corporate life, long before I became a professional organizer. And SMART goals include five specific markers that make it much more likely that you will achieve your goals. SMART is an acronym. It stands for Specific, Measurable, Achievable, Relevant, and Time Bound. And I want to read a couple of pages about SMART goals. So when setting a goal and naming your why, the first criteria is that it be specific. To look better is abstract, but to fit into my wedding dress and look dazzling on my special day is much more specific. I want to get off my cholesterol medicine or get rid of my joint pain are much more precise then I want to be healthy. We know that even small weight losses have a positive effect on blood pressure, blood sugar levels, and cholesterol levels. Bigger weight losses can alleviate knee, back, and foot pain. Maintaining weight loss over time can have a positive impact on your self-confidence, mood, and energy levels. Have more energy is a far less clear-cut why goal than being able to chase after my grandson in the yard without becoming short of breath. Next, goals must be measurable. If you can't track progress against a measurable goalpost, how do you know when you're having success? Put another way, if you don't know where you're heading, how will you know when you get there? If your objective is to lose 10 pounds by the end of the calendar quarter, that is measurable. The scale tells you your starting point, your current weight. You can measure or weigh your progress each week and get feedback, the number on the scale, about how you're tracking and whether you're moving in the right direction. At the end of the calendar quarter, it's easy to see if your weight is equal to your starting weight minus 10 pounds. The third component of a SMART goal is that it must be achievable. Don't set yourself up for failure by naming a goal that is so realistic it can't possibly be achieved. Ask yourself whether it's in your power to accomplish this goal. Is it achievable, not in the abstract, but by you? You may want to have a series of smaller weight loss goals rather than one overwhelming goal that feels insurmountable. Three successive goals of losing 15 pounds may feel far more achievable than one large goal of dropping 45 pounds. Plus, accomplishing each smaller goal will keep you motivated, 
give you positive feedback and propel you to tackle the next 15 pound goal. Starting out looking at a 45 pound goal may feel discouraging and when you lose those first five pounds, which is a huge deal, you may not appreciate that success because you still have 40 to go. It may sound negligible, no, it's not, but those five pounds represent real progress. The next time you're in a grocery store, pick up a five pound bag of sugar and you'll realize, and carry it around while you're shopping and you'll realize just how significant. With a 15 pound interim goal, that five pound drop puts you 33% of the way there. See the difference? Realistic is the next criteria to include in your goal setting. If over the next three months, you will be traveling for business, attending two weddings, going on vacation, taking care of a sick parent, is it realistic to think that you can also undertake a successful weight loss program and the planning that it takes? Maybe you can, maybe you can't. You know you better than anyone else. I'm just challenging you to think about what else you have going on in your life and asking you to think about whether this is realistic, a realistic time for you to achieve your goal. The T in the acronym SMART stands for time bound. Having a time frame or a deadline is vital because it makes you accountable. If you simply say, I want to lose five pounds so my clothes aren't so tight without a due date, you haven't built in a time bound element. Do you want to lose five pounds this month, this year, this decade? by the time you turn 75, <laughs> before you die. <laughs> that open-endedness is very different than saying, I want to lose five pounds by, and fit in my clothes by July 4th. Once you've identified your specific why and made certain that your goal includes every part of the SMART equation, I encourage you to put it in writing. Make a contract with yourself. Many studies demonstrate that people who write their goals down on paper or these days a computer or phone, are much more likely to achieve them than those who merely think about their goals. A Harvard Business Review study indicated that 84% of the population don't have goals at all, 13% have a plan in mind but don't have written goals, and only 3% actually have their goals written down. <laughs> Setting a goal is the first step to making that which is invisible or intangible visible. Make that commitment to yourself, hold yourself accountable, and put it in writing. As a friend of mine likes to say, don't just think it, ink it. <laughs> <laughs> so decide on your goal, know your specific why behind that goal, declare it, write it down, and consider sharing it for accountability, and then go forth and achieve it. So of all the rooms in your house, organizing your kitchen has the biggest impact on your weight loss success. After all, that's where the food is, right? Mm -hmm. So let me share some kitchen organizing tips with you. When you're organizing your kitchen, the first thing that you want to do is empty out all of your cabinets and your pantry if you have one. You want to start by checking the expiration date on products and tossing away anything that's old or outdated. And dispose of food that nobody likes or will eat. You know, just because you went to Costco and bought a six pack of something and you tried one and you didn't like it, you don't need to hold on to the other five. While the food is still good, go ahead and donate it to a food pantry and let somebody else benefit from it. So I've been organizing for almost three decades and I don't think I have ever organized a kitchen where I didn't find at least one or two outdated items. And I wanna share my two favorites. <laughs> <laughs> the first was a bottle of Diet Coke and on the label it said, now with NutraSweet. <laughs> so for those of you who don't know, NutraSweet was introduced in 1982. Oh. I found this bottle of soda two years ago. <laughs> My other favorite was a package of celery, yes, celery flavored Jello oh. with a price tag that said 19 cents. Clearly oh. not too fresh. Oh my so once you've gone ahead and discarded the extraneous items, you want to put things back by grouping like items together. You want to group things in categories. So for example, put all of your 
rice and grains together, put all of your pastas together, put the canned vegetables together, the snack items together. And as you're putting them in the cabinet, put the newer things in the back so that you don't end up with those expired food items. You want to put all the fronts and packages facing forward so that you can see what's there. You know, human nature says that if it's not easy, we're not going to do it. So you want to make it easy on yourself. So you want to make the things that you use frequently accessible. You don't want a serving dish that you're using on a regular basis on a top shelf where you have to pull over a step stool to get to it. And similarly, you don't want the big serving tray that you use once or twice a year on holidays taking up prime real estate space. You also want to store items near where you use them. You don't want to be going back and forth across the kitchen or even into the adjacent pantry, the butler's pantry, to get what you need. You want it right there. So you want to make it easy. As my friend Janine says, when it comes to life, let it be easy. So in researching this book, I found a lot of research studies that I found really fascinating, and I want to share a couple of those with you. There are a number of studies that demonstrate the correlation between clutter and weight gain. There was a study done at Cornell University that demonstrated that women in a messy, cluttered kitchen consumed twice as many cookies as women in the same kitchen that was organized and uncluttered. Twice as many cookies just because there were piles of stuff lying around. Another study suggests that women who keep cereal boxes on their counter weigh an average of 21 pounds more than women who keep their cereal behind cabinet doors. Oh my God. And that same study demonstrated <laughs> that women who keep fruit in a bowl on the counter weigh on average six pounds less than those whose fruit is hidden out of sight. So whether it's fruit or cereal or something else, keeping an item visible seems to offer the power of suggestion. If it's in plain sight, you're more likely to consume it. So I would encourage you to be really conscious about what's out and visible. There was another study from the Personality and Social Psychology um, Journal that demonstrated that when a house is cluttered, it causes spikes in the stress hormone cortisol. And as you probably know, many of us identify as stress eaters. When things in our life feel out of control or overwhelming, we often turn to food for comfort, to self-medicate. So if we can organize and declutter our homes, and particularly our kitchens, we may see a corresponding drop in cortisol levels, which may in turn help with weight loss. All right, so here's the interactive part of the presentation. I thought it might be fun to look at some of the illustrations in my book and see who's had similar experiences that they might want to share. So, so has anybody sat down with a book to read or sat down in front of the television huh. with a bowl of popcorn or snacks intending only to have a small portion but before you know it, before the book is finished or the TV show is over, so is the bowl of snacks. <laughs> Can anybody relate? Yeah. Especially on a stressful day. Absolutely. And it doesn't help that my husband is a huge snack. Yes, <laughs> it's hard when somebody else brings the stuff into the house, for sure. Okay. So um, has anybody started down the road to some sort of weight loss journey only to experience all sorts of obstacles on the path? And if so, how did you handle that? This is the interactive for it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, I have, and I think that part of that was going, like you said, going back to my why, just being recommitted to that. Because as soon as I commit to something that's gonna be difficult, there's gonna be an obstacle. Absolutely. So just going back to the why. Yeah, yeah, keeping keeping that goal mm -hmm. in the forefront and real remembering why you're you're working on it. So, has anybody ever struggled with conflicting goals or desires? 
I want to lose five pounds, but I also want that chocolate cake. <laughs> and I imagine I am not the only person in the room who's gotten on a scale and seen the numbers going in the wrong direction. <laughs> So in summary, you can see that oops, setting clear goals, organizing your home, knowing your why, and having a plan will all help you on your weight loss journey. In my book, I give you tips and tools and lists for everything from managing the grocery store to organizing your schedule to fit in fitness, staying motivated, organizing your time, and more. So before we go to the book signing part, I thought I'd open it up, see if anybody has questions that I can answer. Susan. Uh, I first I want to thank you for years of helping me organize. Mm -hmm. I've hired Deborah for years, <laughs> years and years and years, decades. And <laughs> she's <laughs> had a fundamental change in life. She's, she's phenomenal. Thank but you. what I also like about what you're talking about is I'm thinking of things not just weight loss, but I'm thinking of projects, including some you know about, that I put off, and I'm thinking I can use that smart for that. Right. The breaking down, you said five pounds. I can break down my mother's finances into a small part portion. I like that idea because I, this is, I, I love the idea for the weight loss, but it, I love also that it seems like you're giving tools that apply to other goals that we need to get, and they're abstract. And that, and that was exactly the point, that the, the, um, the concepts in the book can be applied to organizing any area of that. your home yeah. or life. Because yeah. the, the, the why, the, the goal setting, the having a plan and working the plan, all of that pertains to, to anything you want to undertake. I'll let you know how it turns out. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes, Sandy. Hi, Deborah. This, what a great talk. I mean, I just, um, it's so, so you, how organized the talk was. I still see when I open my file drawer to get something, I still see Deborah's Great. label maker labels on there. It was just, why did she make a transportation file? I never thought of that to put, you know. There was your anyway. bus schedules and train schedules. Yes. So. But what, what my related question is, I'm okay with weight at the moment, but motivating myself to do yoga. Yoga with Adrian, there it is, YouTube, big screen TV. I cannot get myself to do it on a regular basis. Can you help me? Can you apply some of that to? So do you like yoga? Yeah, I do. I do. Okay. I, I mean, and the reason I'm asking is because sometimes people will start some sort of exercise program because all their friends are doing it, so they think they should do it, uh, but they don't really like it. And sometimes you just need to find something else that speaks to you. It's one of the few physical activities I don't mind. Okay. <laughs> so what sort of um, either habit stacking can you do? Something that you do that will lead into the yoga, or if you do yoga, how are you going to reward yourself for doing it? Can you set up some sort of incentive? Even the term habit stacking is helpful. I never think that way. Yeah, yeah. like you don't eat breakfast until you do it. Because I won't do it after I shower, so it has to or happen. Or in your case, coffee. Might be more motivating than breakfast. Sharon. <laughs> 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 Silver last week, and I came home to 
a lot of fresh fruit. So I find that for me, that that works for me is to go somewhere where I know I'm going to navigate towards fresh stuff. Not just fruits and vegetables, but things that are made fresh. Yeah, um, I mean, you, you have to set yourself up for success. Yeah. So, you know, whether Could that's... You the question oh, okay. The question it's was... a great question. <laughs> <laughs> the question was when she goes grocery shopping in some place like a fresh market that has lots of fruits and vegetables and other freshly prepared things, she's more likely to bring those home, whereas in other grocery stores that may be a little more challenging. Mm -hmm. Does that summarize yeah. it? Yeah. So, you know, it's setting yourself up for success. If you know that, then try to set up your schedule so that those are the places that you go. Or if you go to a more conventional shop right, stop and shop, avoid the middle section because that's where all the processed foods are, that's where the cookies and crackers are. Mm -hmm. If you shop the perimeter, that's where all the fresh produce is, it's where the dairy is, it's where the, um, the meat and proteins are, and just kind of stay there. The other thing is, make a list and stick to your list and don't because it's the impulse shopping it's those end cap displays that make it more impulsive you know for a while i was doing um shopping online and then i would just drive up to the um little section at the grocery store and pick it up and the ten dollars they were charging this is pre-pandemic for um shopping online was more than offset by the impulse things that I wasn't adding to the cart. Mm -hmm. So that's another option. Mm -hmm. Even my mother, who's notoriously thrifty, saw the benefit of that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mind not being thrifty when it comes to things like that because so I will know if I go to shop right, invariably I'm not going to like the fruits and the vegetables. Mm -hmm. um, it's really hit or miss. And if I don't like them, I won't, won't eat them. And this is the time of year when there's so many farmers yeah. markets yeah. that you can get all of that stuff without ever walking into a grocery store and just get the staples there you know once a month if you buy a little more and then you don't have to go in on a regular basis which reduces the temptation also I just really like that you focus first on the why you hear that back there? Okay, she was talking about, um, she liked the fact that I talked about focusing on the why and knowing that as a reason to move forward. So, and sometimes you have to drill down because that first why isn't really why. So if you just, you know, think of like your three-year-old um, when, when your kids were little and they could, you know, why, 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 and just, just keep drilling down until you really get to the true reason behind it. Hello. Hi there. So I'd like to share that um, Deborah, in addition to being a friend of mine, a dear friend, um, twice in two pivotal points in my life I have needed to hire her. Um, if you take the why and after she's done helping you organize or in this case, you know, possibly helping you change, you know, your lifestyle in terms of eating habits. When she puts the plan in place and you are picking up an item, why am I putting this here? Oh, right, Deb put this here over here. <laughs> and all of a sudden, the concepts and the process and the plan is so structured for her that if you allow it to sort of wash over you as you walk through your day in your home or in your kitchen in regards you know, to this lovely book, I promise you that it will be a lot easier. Mm. Even if it's 
twenty percent easier, it's better than zero percent easier. And so some of the things that you instilled in our home fifteen years ago, ten years ago, like there's and you she was just at our home not not long ago. She's like, You're still doing that? Like I'm still doing that and it's working. So it's all about maintenance. It is. Good for you. Good for you. Thank you. <laughs> Yes. I know I have a challenge of trying, I, I work remote and I'm working at home and um, for a while there I did go to physical therapy so that was accountability, okay, take a walk around the parking lot. Now I don't have that and I made some of the excuses not to exercise. So what are your suggestions for, get, should we schedule time? Uh, I mean, scheduling exercise? time is good. Okay. It, it, did we hear the question over here? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so. Definitely, if you write something down, it increases the likelihood that it's going to happen. Maybe to build in that accountability, do you have a friend or a neighbor or a relative that you can walk with? Because if you say, I'm gonna meet you at the high school track or I'm gonna meet you at the park at 7 a.m., you're not gonna turn over and hit the snooze button if your friend is waiting for you. I did, but I My father was on hospital. Oh, okay, all right. That's, that's <laughs> A legit excuse. So I'm definitely getting back in the groove of being back in my center. So, so yeah, I guess uh, again, but that I'm that's an option. Cool. Another yeah. thing, um, if you have any sort of fitness tracker, you can program it to give you reminders. Like I have my little <coughs> ring, and I was sitting and practicing this earlier this afternoon, and I got a little alert saying time to get up and stretch because I've been sitting still for. Mm -hmm over an hour, and so I have a program that if I'm not moving in an hour, that it's gonna tell me to do that. This is an Aura, but Fitbit does it as well. Um, Apple Watch does it. Any any of those, yeah, Fitbit, um, any of those exercise trackers, you can set reminders. So that might be a way both to help kind of propel you to get up and move, but also you can set goals with yourself. I mean, there's somebody in this room for a long time that we had an exercise challenge where we would set a goal of how many steps we did each day and then we would um, check in with each other as to whether or not we had achieved that goal. But you don't even have to do it with somebody else. You can set a goal for yourself and each week increase it a little bit and just kind of try to best yourself. And <laughs> um, so here's a challenge for you, young lady. Uh, you've been able to get all the answers, so thank you very much. But I'm a late night eater. Give me a box of cereal after 10 p.m. and come on. How do I organize my life to avoid that? <laughs> um, I mean, part of the problem is you work really late into the evening. So. You know, for a lot of people, you can set a after dinner or set, you know an hour after as goal. But you work so late, so but you also exercise a lot. So is it offsetting it? <laughs> no. Okay. Um, does it have to be the box of crackers? Could you have a healthier snack? Could you eat a pint of blueberries if you need that popability? Could it be something like that? So you're still doing that kind of mindless munching, but it's with something that's a healthier choice. Okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> Go get the farmer's market, buy those blueberries. I, I just wanna say, uh, I never thought about before the relationship between organization and psychology, but they're definitely I love this career. You know, I was a psych major, undergrad, um, and then I studied marketing, and they just really interrelate. I could not hear your comment. Oh, how psychology and organizing are connected. I know the the split here is hard with voices carrying. So. I generally had the impression when I read the <laughs> description that it was going to be about organizing everywhere in your house, but really you're trying to focus on organizing your kitchen. 
or are there other organizing things that also help with the weight loss in your I mean, in, in terms of room, it, you know, the kitchen is the, the primary one, but the, the tools and techniques for organizing the kitchen can certainly be applied to other areas that may be challenging in your house. Doesn't just having a cluttered house in general contribute to eating that eating habits? Just having clutter all around. Yeah. All we do is have just a picture. Yeah, right. Well, and as some of the studies I talked about show, you know, if, if the clutter is increasing cortisol levels, so it's increasing your stress, it becomes this vicious cycle. But on the other hand, if the clutter makes you want to scream and run from your house so that you're actually outside and <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe there's something to be said there. Yeah. Yeah. Come back and organize. Right. <laughs> Any other questions? This has been so fabulous.